Welcome to Geneva for WISIS Forum 2019. Creating a fair and equal knowledge and information society is at the heart of WISIS Forum. To discuss it, I am joined by Alison Gilwald. She's executive director of Research ICT Africa and professor at the University of Cape Town. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Sean. Now, Alison, you were speaking on the opening session uh, representing civil society and academia, and you were talking about digital inequality. Why is it such a big issue now? I think we've spent the last decade focusing on connectivity um, and bridging the digital divide. Um, and although we have very limited evidence of what is happening, particularly in the developing um, world or developing countries, and particularly in Africa, um, the evidence we do have suggests that connectivity is only part of our problem. So there's still many countries where um, getting full coverage of the country, because it's mo mo mainly a wireless connectivity um, challenge that we're facing, um, fiber is just too expensive to get it to remote areas. We actually find that in many countries there's well over 90% um, mobile broadband coverage um, and yet internet penetration levels are a fraction of that. So countries like South Africa, Rwanda, um, Lesotho, um, these countries have over 95% um, mobile broadband coverage and yet they have penetration rates of as low as 10% in the case of Rwanda, of 50% in the case of South Africa. Um, so there are a lot of people who could be online if they could either afford to be, or they were interested to be, or were aware of the internet, or if they had the skills to utilize the internet in a more effective way. So I think you know we've been, we've been focusing on the digital divide from a connectivity point of view, but in fact, as we move from voice um, services to more value-driven um, internet data-based services, um, the divide, the inequalities are um, far greater. And in fact, one of the central challenges that we face, I think that policymakers face at the moment, is this digital inequality paradox. The fact that, um, in fact, as we bring more and more people online, the greater digital inequality is getting. Um, and it's not only inequality between those connected and who aren't connected, you know, the, those who are and those who aren't, that obviously remains a, a big challenge, but it's also between those who are online able to um, use the internet productively for their well-being, um, for their prosperity, and those who are barely online um, switching on their phones for a short bit to use very expensive data to make an urgent call or to find a job or something, but not really using it beyond um, some of the most basic communication needs. So what can we do to address this digital divide challenge? So what we find also from the evidence of the after access surveys, which we've done across the global south, um, and including 10 countries in, in Africa, is that the main determinants of being online and the intensity of which you use the internet is education. Education actually is the underlying factor of inequality in relation to gender inequality, in relation to urban poor inequality. It is really at the core of inequality, and this is a classic human development challenge that we have to address, and of course is not easy to address. We'll take you know, intergenerational strategies and multiple generation strategies to address, but there are things that we can do in the short term, and we have to do them. We, we simply cannot continue to do the same things from a policy point of view, from a regulatory point of view, um, from a business modeling point of view and hope to have the exponential growth that we need, particularly in Africa, to catch up with the rest of the world. So a few of the things that we can do, for example, is have far better spectrum usage. Um, we need to, of course, make high demand spectrum available for the networks that have revolutionized Africa um, by you know, providing firstly communication services and our mobile money and financial inclusion and all these um, wonderful things, but as I said, very unevenly. Um, and so the other factors be besides education, which limit getting online, is, is affordability. Um, and even where we have reasonably affected regulation, and re effective regulation is a challenge that's created competitive markets, even where we have some of the lowest prices, like Mozambique, for example, some of the lowest data prices in Africa, the price of the 
um, current mobile communication models we have are simply too expensive for large numbers of Africans, the majority of, of Africans. Even in a country that has 50% penetration, such as South Africa, over 30% of people say they're not online as much as they would like to be because they simply cannot afford those services. So we've got to find new business models, new licensing models. We have to make available the high demand spectrum that these um, big networks require in order to evolve their businesses um, and create um, the backbones and networks that we need. Um, but we also have to liberate some of the spectrum for greater public use, um, for um, free public Wi-Fi so that people can buy the very small data bundles that they can afford, but then can access um, you know, public Wi-Fi networks in order to access government services, in order to you know, do business, uh, create opportunities for themselves and their families, etc. We have to move from these big national exclusive licenses that leave vacant whole um, you know, swathes of spectrum in rural areas and allow secondary spectrum use, much cheaper business models, regional licenses um, that could uh, deploy dynamic spectrum, that could deploy secondary use. Um, and these opportunities, public Wi-Fi, um, secondary use, um, even community networks, you know, enabling um, uh, communities who are maybe being serviced by one operator, but certainly not getting the competitive benefits of lower prices, um, being able to come online without, you know, high regulatory transaction cost licenses and legal frameworks, etc. Um, and this is very suited to the evolution of GSM. 5G spectrum is um, very geared to public Wi-Fi handover, um, to dynamic spectrum use, multiple purpose use, etc. So I think er just speaking about one area spectrum alone, there's a lot that we could do to bring down those prices, to bring people more online, simply from an affordability point of view. And the key here is collaboration, isn't it? It's going to take a collective effort to bring out all the positive changes that need uh, to be out there to address the challenges you mentioned. Absolutely, and even more so when we look beyond simply the infrastructural challenges. Well, I was just you know, speaking about a very small portion of that now. But now in the internet environment that we're in, as we move from voice to data services and to you know, over-the-top services and various global platforms, etc., we require a whole new regulatory framework and a whole new collaborative framework. You know, We have to um, see much greater state coordination between the public and private sector in order to deliver these public public services that the state simply cannot afford mm -hmm. um, in most countries to, de to deliver. We need to see much greater cooperation with civil society around creating um, the rights frameworks that we need, um, around the uh, data governance frameworks that we need um, to create a secure and trusted internet environment that we, you know, that we want. And that's not simply about you know, cyber security and data protection and you know, ticking the boxes on that. It's actually getting you know, data justice in a environment where data has become increasingly valuable and you know new power relations are determined around that in these you know very globalized markets with um, very big powerful platforms that you know transcend um, national sovereign governments that we've you know traditionally regulated in in that sort of fashion mm -hmm. so there's much greater collaboration that's needed between national governments international fora public and private sector civil society um, and the state in order to deliver, to deliver on social contracts. This concept of data justice is very powerful, isn't it? Can you tell us a bit more about that? How well, do you define it? Well, you know, I think it, it means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I think the idea like digital inequality is that if you simply, you know, layer over different technologies or new forms of, you know, data services and things over old um, inequalities and you know, in our case structural inequalities that exist in our societies, you simply perpetuate those injustices, you simply perpetuate those inequalities, that you very actively have to redress inequality if you want um, online equality not simply to reflect offline you know, you know, inequalities. Um, and in fact, because, as I said, because of the value attached to these new data services, because um, of the power relations attached to them, um, you will not only you know, mirror offline inequalities. In fact, they will be amplified online unless we tackle them. Mm. Finally, Alison, uh, let's talk about WISIS Forum because it celebrates its 10th anniversary this year mm -hmm. and uh, you were present from the very beginning, mm -hmm. weren't you? So <laughs> how have you seen it evolved and what do you think it's turned it to, into and why are you still here after you know, so many years yes. where it's still important for you to be mm -hmm. here? Uh, well, I'm not sure why I'm still here. <laughs> 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 um, because I think you know, some, some of the sense each year when comes back and now a decade is a sense of, of, of deja vu, of, 
oh my goodness, we're still struggling with some of these issues. Um, but of course, these are the same challenges because of, as I said, global inequalities, structural inequalities um, that we have, but in a very new environment. So it's, a, you know, it's the most dynamic, fast changing industry um, in the world. Um, it requires an incredible um, you know, uh, effort on the part of multiple people to make it work. Um, it requires significant um, institutional um, building in order to protect the citizens that are involved now in this environment. Um, and we know that those who are mo you know, most vulnerable um, to not getting online, not being able to afford to get online, are also the most vulnerable in terms of the risks and harms that they face in this uh, you know, enormous data onslaught that they, that, 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 that they receive out there and that their data is used to grow and build and, 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 and monetize. So, um, you know, each year we might be talking about similar themes, but the challenges each time are, are new and different. Um, and so I think, you know, we've come a long way when we were first speaking about digital divides in terms of basically getting uh, people onto to basic voice services and, and SMS services affordably. Um, whereas now we're actually talking about getting people, you know, um, into the you know, so-called fourth industrial revolution, participating equitably um, and harnessing the opportunities that exist there while, while mitigating the risks that are certainly there as well. Well, Alison Gilwall, thank you very much. Thank you so much.